It's spoiler in time, ladies and gentlemen. On this episode of Spoiler in Time, we will uh, uh, spoil uh, episode five, I think, of Justified, uh, the premiere episode of 112263 on Hulu, uh, the movie Deadpool. But we are going to start, Brian Brushwood, with special guest James S.A. Corey. And it's not a misconjugation of that verb. Uh, they are a band. Uh, Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank will be joining us to talk about The Expanse, Brian. But first, we are but four hours away, uh, four hours, four days away from the end of the movie Might draft. as well Brian be four hours. With us as well and uh, is ready to commiserate with you on the movie draft. Yes, check out the movie draft. Oh, Tom, Tom, the champion of all time in the history of the winter movie draft. There has never been somebody to bust $700 million except for your slate. Congratulations, sir. You are a colossal winner, not only of this year, but of all years. Well, at this point, I'm not sure how you could catch me. Uh, you've got to get 28 million in the next four days out of Star Wars: The Force Awakens. Well, I, obviously, I'm, more I'm opening million. up a lemonade stand, and I'm going to send all proceeds to Lucasfilm. Uh, but yeah, it does look like uh, that's going to be it. We'll talk more about the movie draft once it's actually final next week. Uh, but Veronica, thank you for joining us. And uh, how excited are you to talk to James S. A. Corey? I am very excited. I absolutely loved The Expanse. It was one of my favorite shows on television recently, so I'm I'm super stoked. We had them on Sword and Laser once a very, very long time ago as the first book in The Expanse series was coming out. So this is a nice, you know, getting the band back together. Yeah, when when we last spoke, Veronica and I, uh, to, to Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham, there was what but one book. That was it. Leviathan Wakes. Uh, the second one was coming out. And uh, now they're going to join us again with many books under their belt, as well as an entire hit TV series. Uh, Daniel Abraham, thank you for joining us. Uh, pleasure to be here. And Ty Frank, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for inviting us. So for, 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 the, uh, for the newbies out there like me who didn't realize, you know, of course, you see, you know, by James S.A. Corey and it's mentioned on the show and everything. Uh, I love this idea that there's an out of the closet pseudonym you guys work under that that's just the name of the band. Like if you guys were Daft Punk, we wouldn't keep referring, you know, we'd say we have Daft Punk on. And so we have James S.A. Corey on. Where did that idea come from? Who suggested it? And did it go through different revisions? I would love to see the list of rejected names that you guys came up with. Well, um, I I always had kind of a, a kink about pseudonyms. I, I have this thing where I think that uh, part of being a writer is meeting people's expectations, and a lot of meeting their expectations is setting them. And who the the writer is, the name of the writer, uh, does a lot of that. So I have different names for every genre I write in, um, and I got three of them uh, spun up right now. When the time came that it was going to be doing space opera with Ty, it made sense to have something that wasn't Daniel Abraham, because Daniel Abraham writes epic fantasy, or MLN Hanover, which was what I was using for urban fantasy. Um, and so just picking another, you know, Ty was still new enough to writing novels at the time that I could pretty much tell him that that was normal and he would believe me. <laughs> and so I got away with it. It was great. So as as we uh, have all enjoyed the first ep the first season of The Expanse, uh, it has been annoying for me to Brian to say, well, in the book it was a little bit like this, and I like what they've done to change things. Uh, how how has that process been? Because you guys have been involved in the writers room, Ty, you're actually at the uh, the offices now. Uh, how has the how has it been going back to the beginning as you're still working on new books in the series to revisit the crew of the Rossi? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because, um, one thing I hadn't thought about is how different, uh, the process is for creating something where you can use pictures to explain what's going on rather than words. And, um, it's been a, it's been a transition mentally for me to get away from over explaining everything in text and letting pictures tell the story. Um, you know, and, and on the other hand, there are some things that we do in the books that you can get away with in prose that absolutely would not work on screen. You know, I mean, uh, especially in the first season, there are chapters in the book where the entire chapter is basically just one of the characters sitting in his apartment drinking and feeling bad. 
um, which you can do for 3,000 words because you can have a lot of interior monologue. It makes for a very boring episode of television, though. So, so I, I would imagine there are, uh, in any great work, uh, there, there, there are compromises and surprises. Were there moments where you're like, where you're like, yeah, there's just no way to do it that way in a visual format. And maybe you were not on board until you actually saw it in the final product where there was there moments of doubts that, that suddenly, uh, it turns out that the decision was vindicated in, in the final product. I, I think there were, for me, there were a couple of times when uh, the the folks there who had more experience than us were saying, "No, this will work. This will work. This will work." And I was going, eh, "I'm not. I'm not sure that's. I'm not sure that's going to work." And uh, I can think of two offhand where I was I was not convinced until I saw this, and then, yeah, that that totally worked. They landed it. It stuck. So how much input did you guys have on the actual casting of the show? Because I am particularly taken with with Miller, with Thomas Jane. I think his physicality is so incredible. He reminds me almost as as like a Heath Ledger Joker kind of physicality to him in, in a really great way. Um, so what, what input did you have in that process? Uh, I, I was lucky in that I was actually there for the entire casting process. Um, uh, Daniel was there for part of it, but I uh, had to go back and forth. He actually, you know, has a family he has to see sometimes. Um, but I was actually on the phone call where they convinced Tom that this was a project he was going to want to do. Uh, I didn't do much talking, but uh, so, but I was still there. So you know, pretty much right from the beginning, uh, Daniel and I both watched all of the uh, casting tapes. Uh, everybody reading on video, we watched all of it. We got to give notes. Um, and there was at least one character in the cast that Daniel, no, two, I would say, two characters that are on the cast that Daniel and I particularly lobbied for and, and got the person we wanted in both cases. Oh, that sounds like a good story that you'll have to tell us off the air sometime at Trinks at a convention. <laughs> Yeah, or, or or an even better story is the person you might have lobbied against. I'm not saying there was such a person, but um, <laughs> and, only, and definitely not of anybody on, that got cast on. because they all look amazing to me. I, I, it's 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 how how excited were you guys to see the vision of what is about to become six books this summer turn into reality as as these things started becoming edited videos? Uh, tell them your story, Daniel. Which one did you have in mind? I've got several. The, the, the person walking past you on set. So okay, yeah, there was there was this one point when I was out there filming uh, the episode we wrote, and uh, it was the the a character who I, I had made up to solve a specific problem writing the book. I, I had a, this chapter I was writing, and uh, there was there was nobody but the one character, and so I had three thousand words I needed to write, and I, there was no dialogue, so I needed to have somebody there to to have the main character talk to, and I needed to to invent somebody to do that. And that guy walked behind my chair to get to the coffee machine. Um, I was thinking you you, <laughs> you I I made you to solve a problem, and here you are. That's very weird. <laughs> and could you get me some coffee? And yeah. Also, that was... does he have more of a? Uh, did he stay a kind of you know for that specific spot did character, or was? has his character kind of expanded since then? We we actually keep using that guy. Yeah, he's, no, he's good. He's like a he's like a reoccurring character now. He wasn't in the book, but we keep using him for stuff. Uh, yeah. Oh, speaking of which, uh, how much license do you have? I I think in a post Game of Thrones world. There's a lot more um, leeway you have with fans of a series where you can see changes, uh, you know, for the screen actually working to to streamline parts of the story. Are, are there any uh, are there any of those moments that you feel like, ah, yeah, no, that that that's definitely I guess I'm asking the same question as before. But um, uh, has your interactions with the fans been any different like has anyone criticized you like oh how come you know they use their left hand for this instead of their right hand and so on people have been criticizing us since day one now <laughs> you, you 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 can't do what any of us here do without having lots of people tell you that you did it wrong and they could tell you how to do it better that's that that never changes how, how do yeah. you handle that you just smile and say well i look forward to your novel 
I don't even. No, that's that's yeah, that's rude. You can't. <laughs> you know. Oh well, you know. Uh, let me know when your TV show comes on, and I'll be sure to tell you what I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, no, you just you know. Yeah, you ignore I them. Mean, you move the, on. You the, do your work. The, the sad fact is, if nobody is giving you a hard time on the internet, it's because no one has heard of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair point. So. Uh, we finished season one and we are greenlit. You guys are greenlit for a season two. Uh, and, and, and Ty, uh, I don't know if we've mentioned it on the show. Uh, Ty used to work for George R. R. Martin. And so there's, there's a lot of people wondering how close books and television shows are going to, to hew together. Now, obviously you've got six books in the bank, so you're not going to run into the same problems. Maybe George is. Uh, but as you go into season two, do you intend to, you know, stay tethered to the story that we saw in in Caliban's War, uh, or are we are we going to diverge off more? I, I like a lot of the new stuff that I've seen in season one. I have to say, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the plan right now is to is to follow the plots of the books. Uh, uh, Narain Shankar, the showrunner, you know, he always sa- says. Uh, to you know, follow the spirit of the books is his thing. You know, you, you want to keep the spirit of it, but uh, you know, a word for word adaptation is boring. Um, you know, you're gonna always try to look for ways to do something interesting or show a piece of the world that maybe people hadn't seen in the books. Uh, you know, bringing officer bringing officer Ali into the uh, first season was one of those sorts of things. We're gonna do some of that stuff in the second season as well. Move things around, bring up characters that maybe don't show up until later, uh, earlier. Yeah, we'll keep playing around with it. Um, if, if anything, I feel, if, what, since I'm in the room, if there's anything that I feel violates uh, the spirit of what we were trying to do, I complain loudly. Uh, I don't know, you know, I haven't been vetoed yet, but I suppose that could happen. <laughs> you try to use your powers responsibly? No, I use my powers only for evil. Uh, do you guys have a, a friendly wager going on with Lev Grossman about your uh, competing sci-fi awesome shows going on right now? Absolutely not. I, I, uh, I think no matter who wins on that one, we're all going to be pleased for the other guy. You know, we like to say that when we have people on Sword and Laser, their books get turned into TV shows. So I just want a little recognition for that. Thank you for that. That was there. very You're kind welcome. of you. We, I will... I will uh, Totally buy you a drink and thanks. Awesome. <laughs> uh, and, and then I have sort of a flip flop of the, of the question that I just asked, which is we have your next book in the series, uh, Babylon's Ashes, coming out August 16th uh, of this year. And I, I believe you have nine total planned. Is that right in the series? Yep. We are under contract through book nine. Okay. So as you start writing the next one, I'm, I assume Babylon's Ashes is, has been set for a, a little while maybe, uh, but as you start on the next one after that, ha- obviously working on the TV series is going to bu- be bubbling around in your mind. You may not even realize how it affects you, but are, are there things you've learned in revisiting these characters that you think you might apply in future stories? Uh, you, you really got to try not to. Yeah, um, no. I, I the, the show... Naomi and show Amos and show Holden and show Avasarala are actually different characters than the ones in the book. Um, and the stuff that's going on in the book is so far removed plot wise from what's going on in the show right now. I, I they, they don't actually talk to each other a whole lot in my head. So you can earth one earth to them just fine. Keep them away from each other. Yeah. You got to be really careful not to uh, get that feedback loop going. Um, I think it, I think it does a disservice to both projects. Well, I have to say we're all uh, huge fans and I, w- I was a fan of the books before. And so I couldn't be more pleased that, that people like Brian, who've never read the books, uh, are, are now excited about the TV show and starting to read the books. Yeah, I did the, uh, as a matter of fact, you could blame Audible, uh, the morning after the last episode aired, I was like, man, that's really good. I want to watch more. And then they hit me up with a, uh, first in the series sale where uh, the first uh, <laughs> book in every series was only four ninety five, And I was like, well, crap, I guess I'm diving in. And it's, it, it is fascinating to, uh, I, I, I'm almost really excited to get past the first book because so much of it is so familiar. 
As a matter of fact, it wasn't until I started reading the book that I realized what an exquisite job the television show did of conveying so much content. Because here I am a quarter of the way through the book and I keep thinking like, yeah, but I know all this. I've already been there. It's like, <laughs> I want to get, get to the other stuff. <laughs> I think they did a really great job too of of I was so curious how certain things were going to look without getting too spoilery but um it's it's done a really good job of translating the text into into visuals uh even in ways I I wouldn't have expected so I've been I've been loving that too. Well, they well, thank you guys team. so much. Uh Daniel, uh thank you for joining us. If people want to find out more about uh the things you write as you mentioned uh, un under other names or follow you on Twitter, where should they go? Uh, well, we have a, a website up that's uh, www.danielabraham.com. I think it's also mirrored to www.jamesessaycorey.com. Um, and I'm Abraham Hanover on Twitter. Um, you can come and tell me what I did wrong and how you could have done it better at any time. I'm, I'm always there. <laughs> Excellent. And Ty Frank, uh, how, how, is, how are folks best going to find you on the Internet? Uh, I basically do not exist on the internet, but if you tweet at James S. A. Corey on Twitter, it's usually me that answers. I've noticed because the the first time I I saw the trailer, I I said the only thing that that struck me was that Miller was kind of skinny, and James S. A. Corey responded on Twitter, "He's a belter," and I'm like, "All oh, right, of course, <laughs> it all made sense." Uh, well, thank you guys for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, you spending a little bit of your President's Day with us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, go back Thanks, to meditating guys. on Abraham Lincoln, and thank you for the gift you've given the universe. Uh, this is uh, an amazing property, and I look forward to uh, to. Wait, wait, is there? T you probably can't talk about how many talks of seasons there might be in the future. I hope there's all the seasons, a million seasons. I can tell you there are 13 episodes in the second season. That's all I can tell you. Hey, hey, Excellent. that's an we'll exclusive. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. All right, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Veronica Belmont, uh, also for joining us. Of course, yes. I haven't seen all the things they're going to be talking about, and I don't feel well, so I'm going to go away and go to bed. Go sleep. Get better. Dream right. of being well. I'll see you guys later. Bye. All right. Bye. <laughs> Let's move on to Deadpool then, uh, Brian. We both saw it over the weekend. And uh, I'll start by saying that the biggest laugh I had through the entire movie was the opening credits scene uh, when they were, you know, crediting people with insults instead of their names, except for the writers who were credited as the real heroes in the room. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I liked it a lot. It did a fantastic job of setting the tone right from the beginning. And I adored that the, um, you know, the, that credit sequence was amazing that it just went from scene to scene to scene. And as it pulled out, it told more of a story of insane chaos, everything perfectly placed in frozen slow motion time as the camera pans all the way around. And then we see the exact scene that leads us to that moment, which I thought was very, very uh, The cigarette clever. lighter was key for that for me because I noticed it. It stuck out in the opening credits. And then when I saw him push it in, during the car chase, I'm like, oh, we're going to get that scene. Yes. And I, I, I was ready for it then. Uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, what did you think of the movie, just in general? I, I thought it was fun. I, I really enjoyed it. I thought Ryan Reynolds did a great job. Uh, he is a very handsome man. And so even with bubbly burnt skin, didn't really look all that bad. Uh, there were a couple of points here and there where I felt like, okay, that's a lot of jokes. You know, not every joke can be the most hilarious joke. Uh, but overall, I laughed and enjoyed it and thought it was fun. Man, I got to tell you, I actually think that the ratio of hits to misses on the jokes were, I mean, I, I, I only got a chuckle out of, out of one out of every three jokes. But the good news is they made a swing every 20 seconds. So that means literally it ended up being a laugh a minute, which, but that's only because it just swung for the fences so many times. You know, some of the jokes just full on like fell flat in the theater I was at where it's like it pauses midway through the action and he says, mm, did I leave the dryer on or whatever? Uh, and again, I, I don't fault. I don't know that I would have written anything better. I mean, there's a beat. You had to do something in there to make it fit. Uh, but the laughs that were hard were very, very good. I loved that it didn't overplay the breaking the fourth wall angle or the insanity angle. It just set a delightfully rubbery texture that made me, once it stayed consistent to its own rules, it set the tone, it stuck to it. And out of everything I loved, I love the conceit 
of him only getting two of the X-Men and two of the <laughs> the way lower tier ones as well. And then drawing, you know, throwing a spotlight on it, yeah. saying like, it's almost like we didn't have a lot of money for that. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it, it was it was a very self-aware movie. Right. And it started that way when it said God's perfect idiot starring God's perfect idiot. Uh, like, OK, it's going to be that kind of movie. This movie is aware that it is a movie and that's fine. Uh, and it didn't break out of it, like you say, it didn't break out of it too often for me to say, okay, I'm kind of tired of that. Let's get back to telling the story. It was always quick. Uh, and the one time where maybe it was too much, they put a flag on that too. And like breaking the fourth wall inside, breaking the fourth wall. Oh my gosh. Like they, they were, they basically, it was as if they took an internet troll, had them sit down and criticize every point in the movie and then wrote a joke about that point. Yes, which is perfect. That's that's perfect comedy writing. That's that's how you respect the intelligence of your audience is by saying, we know you're probably thinking this. You know, it, it, the inverse of that would be if you have a science fiction movie, it's like, I know you're probably thinking we'd all be crushed if we had 100 Gs. We'll just mention the inertial dampeners so that you'll shut up about it. You know, it's, it's respecting the intelligence of the audience. And I felt absolutely respected the entire time. And in fact, one of my favorite aspects was that if you didn't get a joke, it just was on to the next one. And and it's like, you didn't have time to think about like, what was that? Because it was too busy. I, it was great uh, in that regard. Uh, I, I give it a, a strong, strong like uh, in the pantheon of superhero movies. I don't know that it makes top five or even top 10, but uh, I almost don't think it needs to. Uh, and I was thinking about this while I was watching it. There are so many superhero movies now that if everyone tries to be your top five, they will fail. Some of them, because there's only five that can be in your top five and it will be annoying and you'll be disappointed and you'll be angry. And so having I think that was one of the reasons I love Guardians of the Galaxy so much is having the movie that's like, well, you know what? We're not going to be that kind of superhero movie. We're going to be a comedy superhero movie or we're going to be a spoof superhero movie. Uh, and Deadpool is somewhere in between spoof and comedy land, but it's showing me a different approach, which I can enjoy. Absolutely. Uh, one of the other things I thought was really interesting is I saw it the second day. I saw it on Saturday, which meant I saw it with the knowledge that it had absolutely shattered all rated R box office records for opening night. And I think that cast an unfair expectation shadow over over it, because really, I mean, as as fun and as good as the movie was, the, the real genius was in the marketing campaign leading up to it. The fact that they were appealing to all those trolls, the fact that they were marketing it as both a love story and a superhero movie and a comedy. I mean, they really were able to kind of set it up as this blank canvas so it could be whatever you wanted it to be. And even in the movie, he says, I know you told your girl it's a love story and I promise we're getting to that. You know, uh, I, 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 it was it was very, very smart, very, very well executed. And I'm glad for somebody who has tried so many times to make superhero movies work for him. I'm glad Ryan Reynolds found his Tony Stark, you know, his Robert Downey Jr. to Tony yeah, Stark yeah. moment, you know? Well, and it was it was fun that it was R-rated too because there was no holds barred in what he could say and it's fun to hear superheroes, you know, say cuss words and and, and make uh, suggestions that are not nice and they played with that with the X-Men characters that they had. Uh, it was also, I, 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 re I remember this when you mentioned it was R-rated, uh, it was also very unfortunate for the people behind me in line to buy popcorn uh, because they were laughing to each other. Like, did you see how hard that guy stared at our IDs? Da, 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 da. And the next thing you know, tap, tap. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, you're unaccompanied. You can't watch the movie. You have to go get a refund. Oh, no. They said, welcome to our childhood, jerks. Back in the good old days when yeah, RoboCop. Like, oh, they actually came after them after letting them through. They thought they had gotten away with it. It was the perfect crime. Uh, and 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 then they were there was some guy standing behind them like, well, can they come with me? And the, said, if you're their legal guardian, they can. And he's like, well, I'm not. So I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, man. So it's uh, it's interesting because there was a couple of articles talking about um, 
like, hey, Hollywood, now that we've seen the money potential behind a hard R comedy action flick, can we please stop making everything PG-13? Because, and he brings up the example that in RoboCop, guess what? It mattered that we had to viscerally watch the exploding body parts flying off of, uh, of Officer Murphy, you know, because then it meant something to watch him get rebuilt. You know, when villains do, you know, aliens, you know, you see how brutal these these creatures are uh we could get better movies if they're rated r and you know granted that means you gotta give up some family audiences and make less money but or at least it did maybe it means yeah. you make more money who knows all right let's move on to 11 22 63 first episode came out this week it's a hulu original uh stephen king wrote the book and is involved in producing the television series jj abrams also involved in producing the television series he's not directing though uh and it's coming out as an eight-part event, which means we get a new episode every week over the series of eight weeks. Watched it this morning. Uh, so I love the idea that it's like, okay, it's an event. I'm going to get psyched up to watch it every week, but I don't have to wait for it to come on tonight because I have time at 11 a.m. And so does my wife because she's off today. So we're going to watch it now. Uh, we were only disappointed that it was 80 minutes long. Uh, we thought maybe it would be an hour or a half hour, probably an hour. Um, but... All that said, even at 80 minutes, uh, I didn't feel like it was 80 minutes long. Uh, I, I, I told Brian this before the show. I was impressed that the first 30 minutes, I realized, oh, we've seen basically two characters in two location shots. Uh, and and this, is, this is definitely saving them money to pay James Franco uh, by, by not having so many setups. And yet I didn't notice at all. Yeah, I am suffering from the curse of having read the book, mm -hmm. so there's a lens through uh, which I could see an alternate reality of what the story might have been. I don't know what it was like to watch it not having read the book, but I personally felt like uh, there was a lot of telling and not a lot of showing. You know, it, it's as though The Shining started off and instead of giving us 30 minutes of watching marital uh, relation or, you know, the way the family works and getting these unsettling feelings and seeing the hotel and feeling like something's not right. It's as though in the first five minutes is like, hey, man, I need you to watch this hotel, but it's haunted. There's going to be crazy visions of ghosts and stuff. Here are the rules for what the hotel likes and doesn't like. Like, I, I, I feel like the novelty of finding a a way into the cupboard of things that we are told. We are told that this is a crummy world and it would have been better if John F. Kennedy hadn't been assassinated. I don't know. Maybe you should do some things to make me believe it's not a great world, you know? Uh, and then show me, show me crime in the street. Show me dirty, dirty stuff. Give me moments. Maybe, maybe explain that he's getting divorced because their son was stabbed to death by a petty criminal or whatever. Yeah, anything. Make me believe that the world would be better. Uh, second of all, it seems like it seems pretty weird that, that hey, having a casual, casual conversation about you divorcing your wife. Anyway, I'll be right back because now is the right moment for me to go spend four years on a quest to, to go get uh, to, to go try to save John F. Kennedy. Uh, Might have made a little more sense if, if he had even said, oh, in that moment, I realized that, you know, I, this was, you know, I saw you there and therefore I figured this is the one time I really had to make a go with it. And I wanted you to be there in two minutes if I made it back. Uh, I, I he did know. say that. He said later on, he said, I was going and getting your paperwork together in 1960, 61, because I saw you sitting there and knew that you were the guy that I wanted to take over this. Okay, I, again. I, uh, more, more telling less, uh, and less showing than I'd like. I just, I just wish, I don't know. Uh, but again, but again, you know, I'm cursed by having read the books. So uh, did, did you feel any of that? Did you feel like it no, moved I too didn't quickly feel to the that. premise? Uh, I, I, I mean, I know that everyone thinks the world is shit. I don't need to be shown it. Uh, every time a, a, a television show like, Oh, our son was stabbed. I'm like, Oh, great. Okay. So you're telling me the world is bad. Like I need to know. I actually appreciated that they just jumped with that assumption. I can see where you're coming from, where a lot of exposition is done. A lot of sitting and talking is done. And I know you don't like that. That is a very common criticism uh, for you, but I, I liked it because I didn't know this story al already. Uh, and, and it, I, I liked listening to him talk. Uh, I, and I didn't think they overplayed the James Franco, come on, you're crazy old man. Uh, and so 
I don't know. There was something compelling about that actor explaining how this works to me. But I could totally see where if you're like, yeah, I already know all this, like that they didn't do now that you're pointing it out, they didn't do a lot of showing. They did a lot of telling. And in fact, one of the things that they showed at first was that the, when he went through the closet door the second time, everything was the same again. And I and I was like, oh, okay, so so it always resets. And then, of course, we got the explanation when he came back. You might have noticed that all the things were the same. Um, maybe that's a conscious choice because they know people will be watching this in various locations like laptops and maybe not paying 100%, so they want to make it really crystal clear because time travel stories can really mess with people. But no, it didn't. it didn't – Bug me. It didn't jump out at me. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, you know, it. Uh, I, 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 I could be wrong on that. I, I just know. I don't think I was, you're wrong. It's just, it's just re your reaction. Did, did, he, did you get past it at any point? Yeah. Well, once we got into the moment of him enjoying the novelty of being in the space, and you, um, you know, see the the continued surprise as he adjusts to the realities of inflation and stuff, and uh, I, in that regard, once the magic of 1960 started to take over it got a lot better and i do like the way they're representing the strange way the past doesn't want to be changed i think that those are effective moments um the you shouldn't be here motif was well used in that the first few times it was very clear like oh this is a special person who knows he's from not here and is saying it but then there were other occasions where he was being told it in in a way that was perfectly normal and would have been said anyway and so you're like well wait is that is that a special person who's aware suddenly, or is that just a person saying you shouldn't be here? Right. Uh, I, I like that device. So I guess I expected a little more tinkering. I, I would have thought that I would have enjoyed a full 45 minutes of just exploring the hole because it's only two minutes a trip. You go in, grab some stuff. Oh, wait, it works both ways. And then it's like, yeah, that's how I get the meat and all this stuff. Uh, I, I, and then, and then build up to the end of the first episode, you know, we're like, we're gonna save John F. Kennedy. What? And then it's like, that's a big ending instead. Yeah. It was just so fast. I, I, and I, and I still, uh, for example, you know, it, it just occurred to me like, uh, like why not? Uh, I, I, never mind. It doesn't matter. I, I love I, the I idea of, of showing me how it works by having him like go get the meat. I don't know if two people could go in at the same time or not, if that was allowed, but uh, you know, like have him discover that he gets the meat from there by taking him on a trip to the butcher and having him realize like, wait a minute, you bring this back. Well, uh, you know, so, so that would be cool. I did like that. We didn't have to wait. I was actually worried that we were going to have a lot of setup and then end with like, and so now you'll go back. And I was, I was glad that we actually got back to the 60s in this episode uh, because that was definitely the fun part of it. And especially that moment in the diner when he eats the apple pie and he's like, oh, this is amazing apple pie. And he realizes that the sweet waitress that he's talking to is the bitter old uh, yes. principal from the school that he was talking to a few minutes earlier. Yeah, and and there are really delightful moments like that, and I think James Franco, I, I I can fault absolutely nothing in his performance. He he does an exquisite job of seeing the wonder in in him. Uh, that was the fun part about watching this with Eileen, is she was sitting there going, "Huh, so James Franco, like he doesn't have to be a douche. He can be a really nice guy. He's he's doing a great like she kept saying, like he's doing a great job with this." <laughs> uh, yeah, man. No, I I give it a thumbs up. I'm gonna still do it. I I wonder if it's a victim of this staggered release. I know that's what Hulu wants to maintain as the norm, but man, I think I would be a lot more generous in my response if I was already on hmm. episode three by now. Yeah, maybe. I definitely wanted to watch the next episode. I was also glad I didn't have to. There was a certain like releasing me from responsibility. Uh, that I felt when I'm like, oh, I have to wait till next week. That's just the way it works. And I'm I'm built to expect that from Hulu because all of their shows that I watch on there are from networks that only release them once a week. Yeah. Uh, so there was something where I didn't feel jilted. Like I would have, if this was Netflix, I'd be like, well, why aren't they letting me watch the next one? That's the way they do things. Why'd they change? And it's, it's in the nature of Hulu to work that way. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Let's talk about uh, Justified. Episode five of season one. This one's called Lord of War and Thunder, uh, in which we should get a really good arc story where we meet Raylan's father. But instead, we really kind of get a procedural story that just happens to star Raylan's father. Well, and not only that, it's a slow, laborious uh, 
one where it's just like I understand that it's slow and swagger and he comes from a room full of a family full of slow and swagger uh, Southerners or Kentuckians. But but it's just like it, it's it, it took forever and it wasn't that exciting and it felt like it was just setting up stuff for later i i didn't like it i didn't like it and all of you people uh, uh, just be glad that we promised to be in it for the long haul because right now is not great yeah i i i didn't hate it as much as you uh but it, and i didn't hate it i mean you'll know when okay, i hate it I, enough, I just i just enough. i don't mean to put words in your mouth yeah um i i didn't dislike it that much but i didn't love it it was very much like, oh, okay, this is a mystery story, and it's an interesting mystery story, I guess. I can kind of see what's coming around the bank because that guy is obviously the renter is paying his rent, and the guy is senile, and it's going to be a thing, and he doesn't want to help his family. Like it was all expected, nothing unexpected. The one thing that I've enjoyed about this series has been that way of talking uh, that they have uh, as they approach different things, and to have like more of that didn't make it better and that's i that's i think what we were both reacting to is this was this was a long story of of a lot of talking it really was it was more talking and less doing just a yeah. bunch of people talking about things shut up well, show me i put the uh, but, and, and then it's like wait when I, I was confused too maybe i should have been paying more attention uh i was like when did she put the stuff in the secret hiding place and why would she put like one very obviously planted bag in the middle of the hiding place. Like just some of it, it just seemed a little cheap. But like you said, I feel like this uh, this episode is meant to introduce us to Raylan's dad so that we can care about him when he comes back later. Yeah, well, right now I don't. And that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, written by Gary Lennon. So there you go. Probably his fault. Sorry, or Gary. Maybe John Abnett come, who directed come, it. Come be on the show. Next week, we'll talk about the collection. Uh, and that is it for Spoiler in Time. Thanks for letting us spoil you, people. Yeah, dude. Thanks to all our special guests. Yeah, huge thanks to Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank uh, for joining us and talking about The Expanse. We can't wait for the next season. Yeah. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>